All right. Well, we've been in a series. Um, uh, in the, we've been kind of spending some time in the book of Nehemiah. And uh, last week, we kind of started, even though we we're in the same book, a, a, a little bit different focus. And we're calling it Guarding the Gateways. Guarding the Gateways. And uh, we're going to get uh, deeper into the, the actual gates next week. But last week, we talked about the tactics of the enemy, that the enemy wanted to stop the uh, obedience to God, and the enemy wants to, to stop specifically our ability to establish a, a wall of protection or these gateways. And uh, it's pretty interesting that the, that the enemy wanted to, I think the Bible says a thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And that really hasn't changed over time, has it? That's still the enemy's tac- or, or ultimate goal. And we looked at how, how all of this happens. And uh, what I want to look at today is some of the strategies that Nehemiah employed because he was tremendously effective and successful in the face of very, uh, very intense attack. So I remember uh, when I was younger, well, most of my growing up life, but especially when I got to be uh, preteen, 12, 13, uh, I, I worked on the farm and my, I, often with my grandfather. And, um, and that, maybe it was his age, um, maybe it was his demeanor, but he was a, a wonderful teacher. Not everybody uh, is good at, uh, some people are good at doing, <laughs> which he was, but he was also good at, at instructing and teaching and helping. Now, I didn't always appreciate it when I keep getting told what to do and how to do it after, for like the hundredth time. At the time, and one of those areas was driving. And, and one of the, the fun things about growing up on a farm is you get to drive stuff when you're way younger than you should, right? And so he would always let me drive his car or his truck or whatever he had. He'd let me drive whatever we were driving. But part of uh, kind of paying the toll for getting to drive was I, I listened. I, had, I got to listen to the lesson of the day. And uh, I called them lectures. And, um, and so as a... Let me just let you know, those, you know, if you have kids that are 12, 13, 14, um, they may be able to push a, an accelerator pedal. They may be able to steer a steering wheel, but they are not really um, capable of safe, comprehensive driving, right? They, they, they can do the mechanics, but there's some things we have to learn about driving in addition to the, just the mechanics. But I remember, so all the time, driving these country roads, he would be telling me, and often it was these stories or lectures or something about driving, but it always kind of ended up with these, these two things that, that really boiled down, and, and I got to tell you, after probably literally thousands of these <laughs> encounters, uh, you know, how many know they just kind of gets inside of you? That was his goal, I'm pretty sure. And, and one of the things that the story always ended up being was, look ahead. Look ahead. Like, you need to be aware of what's coming your way. Look, be, be kind of all around. Be aware. Look in your rear view mirror. Check your mirrors. Look, look, don't just look 100 feet ahead. Look as far as you can see ahead. The more you can anticipate what's coming your way, the, the better you're going to be able to safely navigate it. And so uh, I just remember hearing that over and over and over. <laughs> look ahead. Look ahead. Look ahead. And then the other thing, uh, and I, th- these would be my words. I'll t- it, w- my words would be plan ahead. The way he, he, he would always say, he said, always, always leave yourself an out. And what he meant by that was, anytime you come to an intersection, he would be saying, so if that car pulls out in front of you, what are you going to do? If that car, they have a stop sign, but what if they don't stop? What are you, where, where are you going? This is when you're way before the intersection, right? When, you're, when you see somebody, if they hit their brakes, what are you going to do? And it was all oh, just day after day and endless and endless. But that starts getting in you. As a look ahead, you start to begin to anticipate what's ahead and plan ahead. If, if that turn signal doesn't actually mean they're turning. Some of you have left your turn signal on and you weren't turning. Some of you have put your turn signal on and didn't really intend to turn. Forgotten, didn't turn. Some of you... Uh, f- forgot to turn and use your turn signal, and then you slammed down your brakes. And, and, and the more we can look ahead and the more we can plan ahead, the more that we are not caught off guard. We can, it doesn't make it not a crisis, but we can usually handle the crisis when we've 
looked ahead and planned ahead. And I think that's not only good advice for your young drivers and our older drivers, but it's some good advice for spiritual warfare. The more we can, we talked about what to expect from the enemy, things like lying, deception, working through people that are close to you, intimidation, fear. We talked about things like trickery and, and traps and, and, and the fact that the enemy doesn't play fair. He's not honest. He's not held to a, a standard that you and I are held to. As a matter of fact, he's called the father of lies. Deception is his, his number one playbook. So we, we can look ahead and see ahead, but what I want to explore today is how do we plan ahead so that we're not caught? I think the New, New Testament calls it the wiles of the enemy, <laughs> the, the plans the, of the enemy. Nehemiah 4, so I'm, I've read it several times. So we see that Nehemiah has been called to build the wall. We see that he's assembled a team. We see that they're, they're building this wall, and there's this uh, outward attack and even inward attack, verbally, physically. There's threats. There's all these things, tricks and traps, and it's amazing to me. It's encouraging to me that Nehemiah navigates this minefield and ultimately finishes the wall in record time with God's blessing, with favor, with supplies of a, of a secular king, uh, with, with resources that are needed. It's quite a, it's a miracle. And it, it gives me great courage that I think whatever God is calling you to do, do you think God loves Nehemiah just a little more than he loves you? No, I happen to be one of his favorites. I think he loves me a little more. No, but I think he loves me at least as much as Nehemiah. And remember, we talked in the, in the end of the worship time, God's resources are without end. So, so if God could bless Nehemiah, supply for Nehemiah, protect Nehemiah, help Nehemiah, he's not out of resources. If he is calling you to a small task or a great task, he can supply, he can protect, he can provide resource, manpower, help. But we do have to navigate the minefield of spiritual attack. Isn't it interesting that God clearly anointed and called Nehemiah, but that didn't make him immune to attack? Matter of fact, I think it made him a target. Now, God helped him, but I believe we're going to find out that Nehemiah cooperated with God. There were some things that God did. God did the heavy lifting, but there's some things that Nehemiah did that were important. We're going to look at his strategies and uh, we're just going to give you three things today. How I many know that's a simple, short sermon that shouldn't take long? <laughs> you know, I saw, I saw several places online this week that said, oh, this fall back time gives us preachers an extra hour to preach. <laughs> yeah, that's a nervous laugh. Some of you are like, you don't need an extra hour to preach. I know. Just three things to write down. One is that he prayed. He was prayerful. Now, this is foundational. It's, it, may be, it may seem obvious, but when you read through the book of Nehemiah, so you see this, this theme from Nehemiah 1 where, where he's, he, he becomes aware of the, the, the wreckage of the city, and he prays, and, and God gives him favor with the king, and he goes to visit the city, and he prays, and God gives him uh, laborers. And, and all throughout these enemy attacks, you see Nehemiah in prayer. In, uh, in Nehemiah, this, I'm going to look all at chapter 4 today, 4-4, four, four, he says, Hear us, O God, we're despised. Turn their insults on their heads. Give them over as plunder. Do not cover their guilt or blot out their sins. They have thrown insults in our face. But he says, he's praying. In verse 9 of chapter 4, he says, We prayed to our God and we posted a guard. See, prayer gives us favor with God. God's favor went before Nehemiah, but prayer also gives us the wisdom of God. I can't, as you read through Nehemiah, especially chapter 4, there was so much deception, so much trickery, so much, there was, sometimes it was somebody inside the city. It was, it, remember the, the, the rabble, the people that were kind of close to you, but not too close. There was all, sometimes it's not crystal clear. Is this an enemy? Is this a friend? Is this good advice? Is this bad advice? 
Is this a legit, should I react to this threat or should I not react to this threat? Oh, come meet us in the valley. Ha ha. Let's have coffee. And, and, and it, it was the heart of prayer that allowed him to, to have discernment to say, oh, no, they just want to, like, kill me. Go hide in the temple and lock the doors. Hmm. That could be wise, but in this case, probably not. <laughs> I'd be sinning. I'd be going where I'm, I'm not in the priesthood. I'd be doing what I'm not anointed. In, and and it, I don't think that's what God's calling me to do is to go hide. God's calling me to build a wall. And it was prayer that allowed him to have the wisdom of God to discern what was happening. See, we, we, whether it's our, our workplace, whether it's the, the news, whether you get it from Christian news, secular news, it's hard to figure out exactly what's accurate and what's not. And we've got to be people of prayer before we react. See, we tend to people who react. Come on. We tend to react, right? Somebody, uh, we, we observe something and we react before we really have a sense of what's true and false and what really happened, it con- before we get context, we have a tendency to react. And that's exactly what the enemy wants to do, provoke us to react. What's terrorism all about? Provoke a reaction be- without thinking. Right? It- it's-, it's traumatic. It's, it's alarming. And it provokes anger and hatred and emotion and fear. And, it, and the, what the enemy, the physical enemies today want to do is provoke a reaction that isn't wise. And guess what the enemy wants to do of our soul? <laughs> Cause a reaction before we get the mind of God. And most of the, isn't it amazing that Nehemiah didn't have to get in this big cussing match He didn't have to get in a shouting match. He didn't have to call them names. He didn't have to even react. He didn't have to do what they asked. Come on and meet us. Um, No. Come on, go go hide in the temple. No. It was only through prayer getting the mind of God that that he could say no and not react to the circumstance. We get the favor of God, we get the mind of God, and we release the power of God, right? We saw, isn't it amazing that th- this was legitimately physical threat against Nehemiah, and yet they never actually attacked. They were capable. I think, at least in part, that was the, the work of the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit protecting. And part of it was the enemy is opportunistic, and when you put up a fight, sometimes he backs off. Sometimes God takes care of the battle for you. He says, stand back and watch. Sometimes God gives you a strategy. Maybe it was Hezekiah. Uh, maybe it was Joshua. Maybe it was Gideon, where they, God would give them supernatural strategies. Worship, march around the city. Maybe God uh, gives you strength for the battle and says, you're going to have to go fight. But it's, it's like David slinging stones. There was an anointing on those rocks. But what we do know is when we pray, God helps us in the battle. Sometimes it's supernatural protection, like Daniel and Lion's Den. Let's keep going, because it's interesting to me. One is sometimes, as Christians who know better, we use prayer as a last resort, right? When everything else fails, <laughs> come on. We've all done it. You're trying to find those keys. You're trying to find that thing you set down, and once you've turned the house over like nine times, then you're like, oh, I should probably pray about this. So God and prayer should be our first resort, but it should also not be the last, the end of the story, Nehemiah prayed, but he also had to cooperate. Prayer alone did a lot. But Nehemiah had additional 
strategies. Let me give you two more. Uh, the second thing I wrote down was this, cooperate with others. So in uh, verse 16, it says, half of my men did the work while the other half were equipped with spears, shields, bows, and armor. So they, they had this team of, imagine the, uh, the, the workers, they're, they're picking up brock, blocks and stones and mortar and, 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 and some of the guys are standing guard. And yet they appreciated this cooperation is necessary, that, that there is a role for the intercessor, there is a role for the, the prayer warrior, there is a role for, for building things and speaking and teaching. There's a role. We, when we work in cooperation, it works. And it wasn't necessarily even always the same people. Sometimes there was a rotation. Sometimes it was your week to, to stand guard, and sometimes it was your week to sling mortar. But the understanding was we work together on this. We value both the labor and we value the intercession, the prayer, the warfare. Because both were necessary. There was cooperation. And interestingly, just a little bit earlier, Nehemiah said that that he kept a trumpet player, a, a, the, the war trumpet with him. And when they would blast the trumpet, he said, they were spread out. There was this whole city wall. And, and, and he said, we're spread out and the enemies are many. And so when you hear the trumpet blast, run over there and help us. And so not only did they respect and understand cooperation, but I wrote these two things down. You have to be willing to blow the trumpet. Now, you, now, some of you blow a trumpet every, every day, right? Some of you are wear, you're just wearing everybody out, it, and you're, maybe you're hurting and maybe you're struggling. But, but I, I just uh, had this conversation with Melissa. So, you know, we're a, I don't know, I'm in the middle generation here, but, but certainly there's some that kind of really have developed a. And like online is where they think and process, and it doesn't equate to my brain. I don't post everything I ate or everything I think or what I saw today. Uh, and some people do, and whatever, that's okay. But um, sometimes we share more than, way more than, than is needed. But let me tell you what happens often, far too often, is we are afraid or intimidated or too prideful to blow the trumpet and ask for help. And I'm not talking about that it has to be online or social media, but are there people that we're in cooperation with, the body of Christ, the family of God, my own family, my friends? Are there people I'm in this with? And am I willing, capable of sounding the alarm, hey, I need help. I'm under attack. I need prayer. I'm struggling here. It's been a rough week. And this strategy didn't work unless they would, you know, can you imagine? I can imagine, because I know some of you, especially men, is, is we're building the way and there's soldiers coming and we're like, I got this. <laughs> I got my sword on my hip. I can, you know, and, and it's this pride thing of, of I'm going to take on a hundred soldiers by myself instead of blow the trumpet when we have hundreds that could come and help. So we have to be willing to blow the trumpet. Nehemiah succeeded because he was humble. And he understood community. And he, he established in this, this ragtag team of builders a sense of unity and cooperation where they said, look, we got all these vulnerabilities and we're going to help each other. And whenever you hear the trumpet, you just go. And we're going to put a whoop on that enemy. So one, we have to be willing to blow the trumpet when we're struggling, when we're in need, when we're hurting, when we're fearful, when we're lonely, when we're sick, when we're hitting the wall. And a lot of times we, we're maybe frustrated that no one's helping us, and yet we've never let anybody know that we're hurting. Come on. But the second part of that is we have to be willing to go to the aid of those that need it. Be willing to come and help others. When you hear the trumpet, 
if that's a text message, if it's a prayer, uh, prayer that comes through our, our texting service, if it's phone a friend and somebody lets you know, if you, when we become aware of somebody's struggle, we can't help everybody, we can't do everything, but we can do something. You can make a call, you can make a text, you can just stop and pray. Right? We underestimate. So I think a lot of times we are paralyzed because maybe the, the magnitude of a need is more than we feel like we can do ourselves. Or, geez, I don't have all Saturday afternoon to go rake pastor's leave, so. But can we pray? Can we send a message? Can we, can we take 30 seconds and say, hey, I, I hear your struggle. I'm praying for you. I'm thinking about you. You know, I've learned to, I've learned the value of that by both receiving that and I've, I've, I've learned to be a lot better about doing that. When somebody comes to my mind, to not look, not to despise or think little of just a quick phone call, a quick text message, a quick note to say, hey, praying for you. And then do it, right? If you're going to send the note, actually pray for them. But we have to be willing to blow the trumpet. We have to be willing to come assist those that need it. You know, just knowing you're not alone goes a long ways. Think about these, these men and women around this wall and, and encroaching enemies all over the place and accusations and threats and, and, and loneliness or, or feeling defenseless is, is the worst thing, right? Even if the threat is real, if you know you're kind of in this together, if you know there's somebody who knows you're there, if you know that there's somebody who, who might be willing to help you, that goes a long ways in our mental health, in our emotional health, in our courage, and our willingness to continue. Just knowing someone's there for you, that someone could help. God designed us to live in community. As verse 20 said, wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us and our God will fight for us. There's some obvious, um, I want you to think about your, your community, who are, who are you in the battle with? It's a little bit the same and a little bit different, right? Uh, we're a church together for sure. You're a, you have families. We have a church community and those are, those are communities and we really do our best, but even inside of that, there's smaller groupings, right? There's classes that pray together. There's small groups that pray together. There's men's groups and women's groups. There's worship teams and cleaning teams and building teams. And, you know, while you're installing cabinets, you're getting to know each other. And, and, and you can begin to, say, to, to encourage each other and pray for each other. While you're, while you're mowing grass, you build a, a relationship and you can begin to have somebody you could reach out to and say, hey, pray for me. We have prayer times on Wednesday nights, and Sunday mornings. Uh, these are great. I love these. I, I, I totally, absolutely use these selfishly. Well, not selfishly, but for the kingdom. But I ask for prayer, right? It's not just to pray for the nations and for the church, but, but I, that's a wonderful place for me to say, hey, pray for me, right? We have to be willing to sound the trumpet. I have a, uh, we have a wonderful deacon board and if you ask them, they can, they'll tell you that, that we talk about church and we talk about uh, needs and community and budgets, but we also talk about life and struggles and, and, and reality, and we pray for each other. I have groups of pastors that I meet with every month. I have a group of guys that I exercise with, and, and we take five minutes and pray before we exercise. It's not a Bible study, and we don't do, but, but it's amazing when you see somebody every week, you start building a relationship, and you, could, you can reach out to them. They're Christian men that I could say, hey, pray for me, and they say the back to me. But we have these networks of people. We have to be willing at times to sound the trumpet and say, hey, I need help. Pray for me. And we have to be willing when somebody sounds the trumpet to say, hey, I'm in your corner. I got your back. Number three, write this down, be strategic. So be prayerful, be cooperative, do this in community. Number three, be strategic. So Nehemiah was really brilliant in this. Uh, and and I, 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 I believe two things. I believe one, I think he was really a, an intelligent person. 
Secondly, I think God really helped him because he prayed a lot, right? And let me give you just a few of the things that Nehemiah did that were, I, I think, translate to you and I. And, uh, and so he did pray, and he did set up this system of cooperation. But uh, write these several things down. Defend your vulnerable areas. Verse 13 said, said that they would, um, they, they guarded the low points, and they would come to those areas of weakness. See, each of us has uh, vulnerable areas, and they're not the same. For some, it's too much shopping. For some, it's too much coffee, all right? For some, it's, it's, maybe it's the computer. Maybe it's online life. It's social media. It's, it's I, I, I waste too much time shopping on Marketplace. I, I don't know who could do that, but it would be, I heard this could be addicting, right? Uh, you know, but wherever our struggle, maybe it's visual, maybe it's entertainment, maybe it's in my friends, but, but if you sit, if, it won't take a, a long exercise for you to think about where am I most vulnerable, right? When I'm with that group, I tend to uh, say things I don't normally say, or I do, when I go there, I, I tend to do things I don't normally do, or, or if I could summarize all the failures of the last year, it, they all, there's a theme here. You with me? And think about what Nehemiah did. He said, there are low points in the wall that are easier for the enemy to attack, and those are the places we are going to put extra guards That's really good advice. Where there are low points in your wall, <laughs> we need to have extra guards. Not just accept, well, that's just how I am. My grandpa was an angry man. My dad's an angry man, and I'm an angry man. No, that's a weakness. That's an ungodly character. Only a fool gives full vent to his anger. Well, it's foolish to act that way. And so... Instead, how about I, how can how can I guard against that? What are some safeties I can do if I know that's a weakness? I've got to work on that. I somebody has permission to talk to me, or I I've learned to walk away and hold, you know breathe ten times or whatever. But I've got to know I know that's a weakness, and before I I got a rule that I don't open my mouth until I take ten breaths or whatever. This figure out how to shore up if it's a any weakness in in technology, computers, online viewing, then you need to put some safeguards in place. If it's spending, don't go to the mall. Don't go online. Cut up the credit card. I don't know. <laughs> Defend the vulnerable areas. Secondly, have a well-armed defense. Verse 16, from that day, half of my men did the work. The other half were equipped with spears, shields, bows, and armor. I thought, Nehemiah was not messing around. He wasn't a, a military commander. He was cupbearer to the king. But when the enemies of, of him and God's people were attacking, he's, he didn't say, uh, you know, everybody hold a rock in your hand, right? If the bad guys come, try to chuck that rock at them. No, he said, we're armoring up. We're swords, spears, helm. Like, we're real deal. We are suited up, ready for battle. If you're going to take our wall, you're going you're gonna, to over our dead bodies, Right? We're not playing. And I think too many times we play. In our defenses against the enemy's attacks. So you know you have a weakness when you're on the internet browser. Well, just saying, well, I'll try harder. No, that's playing games. Right? There are softwares. There are, you know... Maybe you can't have a computer at home. Maybe you can't have a computer when no one else is in the room with you. Maybe you have some uh, high-impact protective software that only somebody else besides you knows the password to. Suit up some real armor. <laughs> if, it, if it's your friendships, if it's spending, if it's uh, your mouth, how can I be militant and serious about defending this area? Right? There's a reason we don't defend those areas, right? Because you don't want to quit. <laughs> but if you're serious about shoring up the area of weakness that allows the enemy into your life, 
then we want to have a well-armed defense. I have, you all know this, I have daughters, uh, and, uh, and so uh, we, uh, we, we did some man things with girls, right? <laughs> we, we did sports, we rode horses, we did trampolines, and we showed guns. And so they all, they, they're all pretty good. And, uh, but they had to start somewhere, and so we all started with the pink daisy uh, single pump BB gun. Oh, yeah. You could throw a rock faster, right? You literally could see the BB kind of wobbling through the air. Um, but, you know, it was something to kind of get the idea, and if you got within 10 feet, you could hit a can with it. And, um, and I, I, that was sitting in my, you know, as the girls got older, that would, ended up in like in my closet. And, and I would just often chuckle, like if, a, if a, some robber came to my house and I grabbed the pink Daisy BB gun, <laughs> they're going to really be intimidated. That's not a well-armed defense, right? It's, uh, it's, it, at most, you might cause an attacker to laugh and maybe gain a second. Um, Take the threats of the enemy serious, and if you're serious about stopping him, then we have to be serious about the measures we take. Uh, number three, don't expose yourself to unnecessary attack. So in verse 23, uh, he said, We continued to work, half the men holding spears uh, from first light until the stars came out. And then I said to the people, Have every man and his helper stay inside Jerusalem at night so they can serve as guards by night and workmen by day. So he had them stay inside unnecessary attack was don't be coming and going in and out of the city. Don't be going out amongst the enemy and then coming back in. Like we're trying to, we're securing the city. We have a perimeter of wall. We have guards and defenses. Nobody leaves town. Don't expose yourself to unnecessary attack. Be smart. Now listen, the Bible says that there's some things that you can do, but it doesn't mean that they're smart. Right? Not everything is essentially sinful. We like, but some things are just not good for you. They're not smart, and they lead you down a wrong path. Don't expose yourself to people. We can't limit everything, but you can choose who you hang out with, who you're friends with, who you're spending time with, who you're giving an ear into your life with. You can choose what's on your television. You can choose what's on your radio. You can choose what books you read. You can choose the inputs of your life. And, and it's foolish to expose yourself to unnecessary attack. If you know that going in certain venues and places causes you to struggle, then don't go there. If going to certain websites causes you to struggle, don't go there. If you can't handle social media, which, let's be honest, there's only 1% one, 1 of the world that thinks they can, that actually maybe can, right? <laughs> the algorithm is against you, right? It's made to trap you. But if, you, if this is a problem for you, don't go there. If you get drug into arguments and conflicts, you don't have to go there. There's enough attack in life in general that you don't have to go looking for it and exposing yourself to unnecessary risk. A lot of times we make the enemy's job really easy. Like he doesn't have to do anything. <laughs> but laugh. There's a blessing in holiness. We, we eliminate a lot of unnecessary attack and struggle and uh, trauma when we make choices to honor God with our life. And, well, my friends are doing that. The neighbors are doing that. Everybody's doing How many teenagers have said, everybody's doing it? Really? I, I'm not and you're not, so that makes everybody's not doing it. Guard the most vulnerable times. It says that they, they stayed inside the gates. Verse 21, we continued the work. Uh, have everybody stay inside Jerusalem at night so they can serve as guards by night and workmen by day. Neither I nor my brothers uh, nor the guards took off our clothes. We each had our weapon everywhere we went. 
even when we went for water. For them, the most vulnerable time was at night, right? In the, in, in the darkness, this is a pre-electricity era, right? They had lanterns and stuff, but nighttime was a vulnerability. They could, they could be attacked. They could have sneak attacks. They could, they could throw things over the wall. It was, they were tired. They were, when people are sleeping and resting, you're, you're, you're less guarded. You're less protected. It was a vulnerable time. So, we said, not only are we going to stay inside the gate, but we're posting guards. We are staying armed, and we are going to protect ourselves in the vulnerable time of the evening. So not only do we think about what are, what, are, what are my vulnerable gates, what are the low points in my wall, but you can also think about this. What are the vulnerable times in my life? Is it in the afternoon when I'm napping? <laughs> but for a lot of people, it is at night. A lot of times it's at night. It's when I have free time. A lot of, maybe it's lunchtime. Maybe that the, the lunchtime crowd or the lunchtime expectations are a vulnerable time for you. If it's entertainment, if it's evening, when I'm, I'm wanting to watch something on TV or wanting to go, go out, know that those are my vulnerable times. If it's 2 in the morning, I go to sleep, I wake up at 2, and I can't get back to sleep till 4, and everyone else in the house is asleep, if, if 2 to 4 is your vulnerable, then how can I protect the vulnerable times? Because the enemy's, I don't want to say he's smart, but he's, he's not ignorant. He is absolutely aware of your vulnerabilities. And we've seen in Nehemiah, and you've all experienced in your own life, that's one of the main tactics of the enemy is to exploit our vulnerabilities. He has limited resources, and we have the power of the Holy Spirit. He's, he knows better than to take you head on, right? If you're a born-again believer full of the Holy Spirit, he, the, you can stomp on the devil, right? You know you've got authority. You know you've got power. You know you can release an anointing against that enemy. He's under our feet, so he's going to be more sneaky and attack the weaknesses in your life, and attack weak times in your life. They slept. Guys are going to like this, right? I mean, he saves on clothes, so, you know, all that. So you're just ready to go in the morning, just on your feet, and out the door you go. Yeah, clearly, they weren't bathing. All right, slept in their clothes. So, but they were guarded in the vulnerable times. And you need to think about this. I can't answer that for you, but if it's lunchtime, if it's evening time, if it's the middle of the night, how can I set up safeguards? How can I arm myself? <laughs> how can I set up defenses in the vulnerable times? Because clearly those are opportunities for the enemy to attack. And kind of on the same scripture, I just wrote this and we'll be done. Always be prepared, right? They always had their sword. The workmen had a sword, and, and, and they, they worked, but they, they slept with the sword. It says we went, it reminded me of, of uh, Gideon. Remember when he took all the soldiers to the river, and he said those that lap, stick their face in the water like a dog, send them hiking. <laughs> those that, that have their hand on their sword and that cup their mouth and that are watching and drinking, those are the ones, you only need 300. It was the alert and attentive and armed soldiers and that's the picture of Nehemiah, right? Working with my sword, sleeping with my sword. What's the sword? Right? It can mean a lot of things, but certainly the New Testament refers to it as the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit. All right, let's get uh, Michael. I'm ready for some anointed piano. We're going to pray in just a minute. Um, always be prepared. I, was, I heard this uh, story. There's a pastor that I... I've, uh, in, in North Little Rock, Rod Loy, who, his house burned, and, uh, but he's a really a, um, an inspirational voice uh, to a lot of pastors. But, but I, heard, I heard him talk about it, and, and something um, caught me when he talked about his house burning, because they were, it's the middle of the night, they're asleep, and, and, they, they, and you know, the, the fire alarm goes off in their house, and they, I think they smelled smoke, so like they knew it wasn't, you know, a, a false alarm. And they had seconds to react. And he said, you know, this is his reflection after the fact of things he was thankful for, you know. And he, he was thankful for the people and, and the support they got, thankful to be alive. But he said, you know what? 
we just had this habit of, uh, I always kept a flashlight on my nightstand. I always kept a pair of like sweatpants, just, you know, phone rings, kids come, whatever. I just had, I had <laughs> like some sweatpants and a, and a flashlight where I always knew where they were. The fire alarm goes off, the smoke is there. I was in my skivvies. <laughs> I, I could put on some sweatpants, grab the flashlight, and literally that's what we walked out the door with. He said, I'm so thankful we were ready. Like, we we were ready. And we talked about this with Nehemiah, the sword and the trowel, that this readiness anytime, this attentiveness that there's an enemy that wants to attack. We The greater one, greater is he that lives in me than he that is in this world, right? We have the greater one, but we just have to be ready, attentive, prepared. Keep that sword, the word of God, at the tip of your tongue right? All the time. Be observant. Don't give a a foothold. Don't give a single little space to the enemy. We're going to get into this more next week, but you know, it's a lot easier to deal with the enemy when he's outside the wall than when he's inside the wall. It's worth putting up some serious fight to keep the enemy at bay because probably more than we care to know the enemy has made inroads into our lives. And that's a whole, it's a whole lot easier to, to deal with a, a temptation to drink than an addiction to drink. Right? It's a whole lot easier to stop things before they start than to deal with the repercussions after they've happened. Prayerful, cooperative, strategic. Or in the words of Grandpa Sambanak, look ahead <laughs> and plan ahead. Let's bow our heads, would we? Let's pray together. If you're here this morning and you're not in, in a relationship with Jesus, I've got great news for you. We talked about it at communion. He loves you so much, so much that he, he died for you. That's a lot so much that he's in heaven right now making intercession for you and so much that there's nothing that pleases God more than one, one, of, one of us making that choice to know him as Savior. If you're here and you, you really haven't done that, now, you're obviously interested in the Lord, you're here in church, you're watching online, you're, you're curious, you're, maybe you've been in church a long time, but if you haven't really committed your life to follow Jesus, invited him in as Lord and Savior, it's kind of like um, this picture of Nehemiah. And the, they had to build that worship center, that, that temple. And the presence of God was the first thing, the first building block <laughs> to getting life restored is bringing God into the center. And uh, if you haven't done that, I want to pray with you. Anybody just raise your hand. Just say, Pastor, today I'd like to surrender my life to Jesus. I'd like to know him. I'd like to know I'm forgiven, to know I'm ready. If you're watching a video of this or watching online, you can pray with us right now. I want to invite you, church. Can we pray together with those that are responding and just make that surrender? Let's pray out loud. Thank you, Jesus, for loving me. Thank you, Jesus, for giving your life as a sacrifice for my sins. Today, I invite you into my life to be Lord and Savior. Forgive me for sin in my life and give me a fresh start. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Isn't God good? Amen. He loves us. It's unbelievable. I want to just take a minute and do this. I, I know... I know human nature enough to know that the minute we leave our seat before you get to the door, (laughs) you've shifted gears into lunch and and whatever the rest of your day holds. And um, and so I want you to take 60 seconds. And I want you to answer these questions, and and I'd really like you to write it down somewhere. You don't have to show it to anybody. You can make a mental note, but sometimes they get lost. (laughs) 
type it in your phone, write it on a piece of paper. But I want you to think about what are, what are my, the low points in my wall? In other words, what, where am I vulnerable in life? And what times am I vulnerable? Or another way to answer this question would be, what are the areas I need to establish some defenses? And the other thing I want you to think about is, what can I do? What are the weak areas and what can I do to help defend it? It's something we don't spend enough time thinking about. You could frame it this way. Where have you failed (laughs) recently? That's a weak area. What could I have done? Let's think about it. Who could I have called? What could have been in place? How could I have handled it differently? What can I learn for next time? There's some simple things I do. We're all a little bit different, and our struggles are all a little bit different. But, for example, I don't, I don't meet with a lady alone. Right? No, it doesn't matter. Uh, it's just a policy. Why? Because it doesn't mean that I'm attracted or not attracted. It means I'm not going to put myself in a vulnerable place. Just not going to do it. Things like uh, Melissa and I kind of swap phones not on purpose, Melissa always forgets her phone and uses mine, but it's a good defense because she, she'll just flip around and check stuff and I welcome it I want her flipping around and checking stuff I got nothing to hide, but I want to I wanna be checked right? I want somebody looking at my phone I want somebody anytime to be able to grab it and say oh, what was that text message about? Those are just some examples, but how can you set up? What are the vulnerable areas? What can you do about it? Some of this evolves with time. Maybe what you used to struggle with isn't your struggle anymore, but now there's something different. If you find yourself gossiping, if you find yourself sucked into arguments, if you find yourself overindulging, What can you do about it? God loves you. (laughs) He's got a plan for you. But he wants you to be victorious. He wants you to be productive. He wants you to finish the wall you're assigned to build, whatever that is. He wants you to complete your assignment. He wants you to prosper. He wants you to be healthy. He he doesn't want you beat down and full of grief and and regret and shame. He wants you living victoriously. And he'll help. That's where we start with prayer. We're ready to blow the trumpet, but we also do some smart things. Amen. Amen. Let me pray over you. As I do, our prayer team's going to come up and be up here at the front. And once we're closed today, if, if you'd like prayer today, we're here. We'd love to pray for you. We've been seeing people healed. We've been seeing miracles. We've been seeing a lot of great things happen. Um, we're going to be here ready to pray for you. So, Lord, I thank you that you're our helper, our ever-present help in our times of trouble. I thank you, Lord, that you're not a, there's no condemnation. You're not pointing the finger at us. You're not mad at us. But you love us and want to help us. And, uh, and you want, you're, you're ready to come to our aid. Lord, I thank you that give us strategies. I, I know this. The enemy is strategic, but your strategies are better. <laughs> you have more wisdom, more power, more insight more knowledge, and more love for us than the enemy will ever have. So we're asking for your wisdom and strategies in our life. And uh, Lord, thank you that you help us shore up the walls of our life that we can uh, give no place to the enemy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have an amazing week. And uh, again, if we can pray for you, we're here. We'd love to talk to you, pray for you. Join us on Wednesday night prayer at 6. Join us Sunday mornings at 10. Join us for a Sunday school class at 9. God bless.